In this series, we're going to examine the Godhead doctrine that's been promulgated by the likes of Brian Denlinger, Philip Newton, Jacob Thompson, and others. Their doctrine is anti-Trinitarian. Their arguments are anti-Trinitarian. They consider those who ardently defend the doctrine of the Trinity to be unsaved. You need to be saved. If the Trinity is the core of your faith, you're lost. Thus, I myself, along with countless other Christians, am headed for hell. Yet this should cause us no consternation, for their arguments will be shown to be vapid and baseless, and we would be safer crossing the Grand Canyon on a bridge of horsehair than entrusting souls to these men and their pernicious doctrine of God. Now in at least one aspect we are in agreement. The worship and adoration of a false god is idolatry, which is a damnable sin. A false god entails a false Christ. A false Christ means a false gospel, and a false gospel means no redemption, no communion with God, no peace with Him, no acceptance into His presence, no forgiveness of transgressions. Whatever our earthly struggles might presently be, whatever even our spiritual desires might seem, if the God we worship and in whom we place our hope is a figment of our imagination, and anything other than the one true God is such a figment, then we are without hope, and of all men most miserable, as the Apostle Paul says. Now by his sins man is rightfully judged of God, and worthy to be damned. All men have transgressed the law of the holy God Jehovah, and the wages of sin is death. However, God in his rich mercy loved man even when he was dead in sins, and has given His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to be our propitiation, to be our mediator, that we might be brought into fellowship with God. Jesus Christ bore our sins by His death on the cross and became sin that we might become righteous in the sight of God through Him. By faith alone, that is, by no work or deed on our part, we are counted righteous in Christ. Jesus Christ who is very God and very man, is at once able to perfectly obtain the righteousness we are unable to obtain through the working of the law, and he is able to bear the punishment we deserve, and yet to overcome death through his divine power and righteousness. Now this series will, unfortunately perhaps, be long-winded. In examining what we'll call Denlinger's Godhead Doctrine, we'll not only cover the immediate arguments, but the deeper presuppositions on the part of its adherents. Since, like me, Denlinger believes in the authority of Scripture, we have to go to Scripture to establish our beliefs. However, we must be consistent in our use and interpretation of Scripture. We can't merely cite verses that sound like they're on our side and conclude a winner. We'll have to go deeper biblically, logically, historically, and metaphysically, for these are the very fields upon which they're making their attacks. Their arguments against the doctrine of the Trinity are not merely based upon the text of Scripture contrary to what they say. Therefore, they must be met on the grounds they have chosen to attack the truth. They might not be aware of the claims they are making, but if we are going to be thorough and beneficial to the Church of Christ, we must be vivacious and aware of the position of their attacks. Now, As we address the heresy, there are four points that tie together forming the framework behind their arguments. I'll lay them out here with a brief response to each so you can keep this noted in your mind and test the accuracy of of my claims. First, Biblicism. In the form they utilize, one merely needs the bare words of Scripture to form doctrines. Our doctrines, our expositions, and our language ought to be within the bounds of not only what Scripture teaches, but the words Scripture uses. Hiding behind the piety of simply following God's Word, this viewpoint constrains God's ability to reveal Himself to the simple words and phrases used. In Biblicism, the interpretational authority shifts from a more textual, historical, Christian theological form to merely the idiosyncrasies and assumptions of the reader or teacher alone. What the text means is constrained by the mind of the reader. However, Denlinger and company are inconsistent in their use of this foundational point and argument. Secondly, extreme King James onlyism. In the form they espouse, the King James becomes disconnected from the original language text it is a translation of. This is in the same vein as the broader Biblicism and results in an added element of ahistorical understandings of the text. In other videos, Brian states that while the Textus Receptus is the correct Greek text to use, there's no need to reference it since we have God's definitive word in English in the King James Bible. Um, what you're going to find as you are a Bible-believing Christian, when you start to say this is God's book right here, King James Bible, uh, 
right there, God's book. I don't need Greek. I don't need Hebrew. I don't need other versions to clarify commentaries. Nope. King James Bible. When you believe, when you come to this book, believing that this is God's word, God's perfect word, um, the Holy Spirit will start to reveal things to you. It's amazing. And you'll find little phrases in there and all of a sudden you think, whoa, check that out. The King James Version is the standard, the standard for our lives. Okay, um, James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 talks about being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. All right, this is the standard. Not, well, I, I use the King James Bible and also the Textus Receptus. If you can hold two different things in your hand as your standards, then guess what? Who's the final authority? Not here, not Textus Receptus, you are. See, this is no good to you today as a Christian. This is a waste of time. This book is good to you. This book will change lives. It'll change your life. I'm sure many of you out there right now are nodding saying, yeah, it did change my life. I praise God for that King James Bible. So, which Greek text do I recommend? None of them. I recommend the King James Bible. Now, once you create a divide between the English translation and the Greek text is a translation of, which was directly inspired by God roughly 1,600 years before the translation, you'll end up coming to some strange conclusions. Third, denial of metaphysics and philosophy. Philosophy is merely knowledge. There are different schools or areas of philosophy. Metaphysics deals with the nature of reality, substance, existence, potentiality, actuality, etc., now, Dellinger's claim is that their system doesn't make use of metaphysical terms or arguments. However, when they speak of God's existence and parts and man's existence and parts, they're making metaphysical claims. When they say God has three parts and is one being, they mean something by those words. So here's the issue. When Brian denies they need metaphysical terms, they're excusing themselves from having to provide any thoughtful definition or consistent usage of the words they're utilizing. When you start to ask questions such as, how does person differ from being? What does with entail? The meanings start to break down. But when those questions start to come in, reflection isn't the result, but doubting the salvation of the questioner. And fourth, conspiratorial mindset. This results in making connections that are illogical and irrelevant. Some conspiracy theories happen to be true, and some do not. Sometimes the cause behind an event or the trajectory of history is an individual or group of people or an organization with excessive power. Sometimes it's the path of least resistance due to man's sinful nature. This is neither to throw anything that sounds outlandish out as a conspiracy theory, nor to accept as absolute truth anything that sounds plausible, but to be balanced and consistent in our lives when it comes to these things. However, these men can see large portions of church history and doctrines to the Roman Catholic Church or the Jesuits by bestowing on them almost godlike attributes.